Hello and welcome to the Harwood Report for August 27th, 2017. Presented by Trade Academy, I am your host, Keith Harwood. I am the owner of Trade Academy, and I hope you can find some information out of this uh, presentation today. Let's go straight over to the disclosures. All services and content are provided for educational and information purposes only and are not intended as legal or financial advice. As always, please read through the entire disclosure. Um, there's a fancy little pause button on this video that you can click if you would like to read them in, t in their entirety. The main gist is that nothing that I say here is trade advice. This is for educational and informational purposes only. Do your own due diligence before you enter into any trade and make any sort of decision. This week's going to be a lot, uh, very similar in terms of what I'm highlighting as uh, last week. Um, the main indices, S&Ps, NASDAQ, Russell, Dow Jones. Get right back into the rates, forex, commodities, uh, dollar, yen, gold, the miners, the junior miners again, and PLT. Um, let's see what's changed uh, as a result of some of the action from the week, as well as what happened in Jackson Hole. Uh, and then going to the sector indices, we're going to go right back to EWZ Brazil, um, kind of get a status update there and, and new thoughts on how to approach this trade from here. And then XLE, we've been talking a little bit about financials. They just seem like they're... Um, kind of a fool's game right now with where ball is and the lack of movement. So I'm going to switch over to the energy sector and take a little look there as I think there's some interesting action in the charts um, for energy stocks. So let's dig right into it. Um, S&Ps. Our action for the week was pretty dull, I guess. Um, you know, the 22nd Tuesday, we had a nice rally. So let's see. We broke last Thursday, sat on Friday, sat on Monday, rallied Tuesday, and then sat for three days. We tried to have an interesting rally. I thought on Friday, I thought the Jackson Hole could be an interesting catalyst to get us to rally to new all-time highs or break out below. I mean, really, that range on Tuesday was kind of the bounds for us. The high of 45.62, the low is 4355. And we got within a tick of the high and didn't really retest the low. So right now... Price is just sitting right here on the 50-day moving average and also the 10-day moving average, a little less important. Um, I don't see a reason to get too aggressive trading the S&Ps here, especially not with options. You can buy near the low end of the range, which is pretty much bounded by the 100-day moving average. You can sell near the high end of the range, which is around here at 47.5. Um, you got to get a vol benefit to do it if you're going to do it in options. I like the defined risk of doing that with options when you get there. I don't necessarily think you want to play for a breakout, but if you're selling here, you're clearly using the previous all-time high as a stop and flip long. If you're buying down here, you're using a close below the 100-day moving average to flip short instead, targeting then that move to the 200-day moving average. So you've got a decent r, &R on that break. There's about six bucks if you can get a close below here. Um, otherwise, you're looking at trading tighter ranges, buying around 242 to sell around 245 and getting short around 247 and a half to get flat around 245. So these are really narrow ranges, not that exciting to me. And again, one of the problems that you've got here is that if you look at SPY, implied volatility, uh, it, you know, I'd like to see vol cheaper if I'm going to be trading these tight ranges back towards the 6 7% uh, 30-day vol. Right now we're at 10. Um, there's still some fear in the market after what's happened the last two weeks on those Thursdays. Add into that, this weekend, there was some discussion about North Korea ballistic missile testing, so maybe that's going to come back into the limelight. That could put a little bit of a vol premium. doesn't necessarily push the market down, but you know, if you get a vol premium in, then you're trading tight ranges with higher vol. I mean, you'd have to be doing this with short outright options, and I don't love going and recommending a lot of short outright options right now. So the best trade here for me in the S&P is to just kind of avoid the options, um, unless you're trading really short data weeklies because of an expectation of a bounce here or a breakdown here. The lower end of the range is a little more fun than me. The upside of the range, it's a little tougher because you could just end up with a long chop like that again. Then you um, would rather go into sector rotation trading instead of focusing on the big guys like S&Ps. Uh, so we'll go through the others real quick. They're going to be very similar. NASDAQ trading just above, <clears throat> excuse me, the... Oops, I'm on the, I got the wrong values there. Uh, there you go. So you can see it's trading just above the 50-day moving average. Um, same sort of excitement level for me here. You might test the 100-day moving average. It would be a great buying area. You probably actually need to be buying we'll look before we get to the lows of uh, last Monday. 
Selling areas around here at 144 and a half. Again, vol's not that cheap. There's nothing too exciting. Let's not waste too much more time looking at that. <clears throat> Let's go over to the Russell, the small caps. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is, sorry, loading slow for me. There we go. Uh, this is a little more interesting because we've had that failure, <clears throat> the close below the 200-day moving average, the washout, and now we're sort of grinding higher here. Higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. This is kind of a nice little formation here. Next up would be a close above the 200-day moving average, and then people might get excited and start rotating into the small caps. So that, to me, says that if we're going to go bullish, this is the sec this is the major sector that I'd be more inclined to put some um, risk on. You have to use the lows or something tighter as your ultimate stop out. But if you can get a close above the 200-day moving average, you can either use a close just below as your stop or you use a close below, say, this 10-day moving average as a stop. And you look back for a move back towards 140, 141. So that's a decent return. That's 4%. Um, optionalizing it might be a little more interesting here. Um, you can see that the implied volatility on the 30-day for IWM is basically in line with the NASDAQ. And yet, I think that this has a little bit more potential for movement. You can see recently the realized vol has been 13.5%. NASDAQ's been also 13.5%. But if you get a little bit more of a directional move in uh, the Russell, then maybe that can kind of catch up. And you should see a little bit of the implied volatility coming down if we get um, that close above the 200-day moving average and start getting a little bit more bullish flow. So that's where I'd be looking then. If you're looking for 4%, that's going to probably take two weeks to get there. So you look towards September 8th or even September 15th. But we'll start at September 8th. And you're looking at... God, I mean, the 138 and a half is for 64 cents. Maybe do the call spread, the 138 and a half, 140 call spread for 41 cents. And uh, that targets you for that move towards 140. And uh, if volatility comes down into the rally, as I expect it would, then you've got a decent r, &R at that point. Still not a crazy, sexy trade. It's just at least better than the S&P and the NASDAQ. So, yeah, I'm probably not going to be looking to do anything major here. This, I'll use the close above the 200-day moving average as a potential signal that the world is a little more confident, volatility on the whole should come down, and I start looking at some of the more small cap heavy sectors such as energies um, and biotechs. Let's go finally over to the Dow Jones. Um, as always, it's kind of been the strongest. It barely really tested the 50-day uh, moving average on the break earlier this week. Sitting right here at the 10-day, just below the 20-day. Um, very, very much the same. Not exciting. Um, I'm not going to waste any more time there. We're going to move over to the little bit more interesting stuff. First off, dollar yen. Our signal has and continues to has been and continues to be the 10-day moving average. A close above makes us more neutral. A close below keeps us bearish, and a close above the 20-day moving average then starts to get me into an expectation of a flip in the trend. Again. You look at them. These breaks, you'd have one day above the 10-day moving average, but then everything else kept going. And then once you got above the 20-day moving average, you had a nice little run. You got below, it starts to flip. So you've got these nice waves here. It's been a long wave down. We haven't gotten a lot more legs out of this move. We've kind of stalled here near the June and April lows. you got to see this break pretty soon. Otherwise, we're going to get a close above the 10-day moving average. And then you might start seeing some uh, a little bit more buying flow into the dollar. The caveat there would be something going wrong in the world. Um, you know, again, North Korea, if tensions escalate, that could create a little bit more pressure on the dollar, a little more risk off trade, and that gets us excited into the trade that I uh, have been focusing on as a result of the dollar yen, and that is gold. So you look at GLD, it's doing the same thing as we just said in the dollar yen, consolidating here near April and June highs. Been sitting, it tried to break down on Friday. Somebody came in with a massive sell order in gold futures before the um, before Yellen's speech at Jackson Hole. It was probably trying to trigger some stops. I'm not exactly sure what the, the reasoning for it was, but at the end of the day, it basically did nothing. Gold settled unchanged. Jackson Hole between Yellen's um, conversation points and Draghi's meant absolutely nothing to the rate structure. At the end of the day, it had very little impact on the dollar. So we've got non-farm payrolls next Friday, or this upcoming Friday. We've got 
a long weekend coming up, there's a likelihood to me that we're going to see a little bit of buying in gold just because of the, the tensions potentially escalating in North Korea and people always having a little bit of fear as a result of that. So until But until we get that um, firmness in the dollar yen or we start seeing some follow through selling in gold, uh, I lean towards the bullish side. If we go over to the options in GLD, it's the same as what we've been seeing. So you can see that the implied volatility in gold is still sort of middle high end of the range, realized well is a little bit lower. I'm going to go over to the miners though again. GDX still has implied vol at the lows, realized vol has been low. I understand that. Same thing with the, the uh, junior miners. Let's look at the charts of the gold miners and the junior miners though and see why those volatilities are trading at a little bit of discount. And you can see it here. While gold is trading right up against April highs, uh, the April highs here are closer to 24 and a half. June highs are closer to 24. And we are sitting at 23.35. So we haven't had the full, sorry, 23 and a half ish range. We haven't had the full move. If fear really comes into the market, I got to think that these miners start to catch up. You can see this kind of wedge that formed here. If you kind of draw a line there, a little bit of a breakout. We're above all the key moving averages. Everything looks pretty nice there. A lot of higher lows and higher highs. A little bit of a flag there that we then broke out of. So some good stuff to see here in the near in the recent term. The high there was 23.48 and now we're traded. We broke above that but settled a little bit below it on Friday. I still think the miners are a very interesting play as a result. Um, even if we get a move to you know 2375 early in the day on Friday on Monday because of the North Korea stuff. I'm not sure how that's going to impact the markets. To be clear, I don't know if people are going to put that risk off into the market. Um, I would normally have said yes in the past, but now the way that we just kind of disregard some of this news, there's no guarantees on any of the stuff anymore. But let's assume if we assume that maybe there is a little bit of a bid here. Yeah, you know, then you're actually looking at a breakout instead. So that gives you more reason to be looking at potentially buying some calls here. I want to focus any options I'm buying in GDX, uh, the gold miners, into September. So before we were looking at September 8th, I want to have a few weeks. I want to have the non-farm payroll number here for September 1st. I want to avoid next week a little bit just because we've got Monday off. Um, and so I want to take my theta down a little bit, even though there's a small ball premium here. Part of that is because we have a long weekend uh, before the September 8th. September 1st is cheap. But because we've been a little bit reluctant to move and the historical ball has been a little bit lower, I'm going to go over to September 15th, which still gives us a lot of leverage and it's good. To, it gives us a pretty good gamma. So if we're looking for a move back on the chart, say let's test April highs. We're looking for a move just below 25. Um, well within reason. Volatility is about 24%. That's one and a half percent per day. If you want to calculate it out over the roughly three weeks, it's going to be square root of the number of days, so roughly four times one and a half, which is six percent. Six percent of twenty-three and a half gets you about a buck thirty, but it's you just below twenty-five. As a result, looking at these twenty-fours and twenty-fours and twenty-four and a halves, I tend to like the twenty-four and a halves a little bit more because I like the idea that volatility will get bit into a rally. That said, it hasn't played out that way yet because we haven't had a good enough rally to get volatility bid. But if we do get this kind of rally, you get a lot of leverage out of those 24 and a halves. Yeah, if we only get the 6% move, these are barely making money, if at all. That's where the 24s do much better. 24 and a halves do a lot better if we start getting move above 25. 24s are better on a move between basically you know 24 and 25. So in that dollar range, you'd rather have the fours. Anything above 25, you'd be happier in the four and a halves. And if volatility gets bit into a rally, you love the four and a half. So keep an eye on North Korea. If tensions escalate and you think that there's going to be a big risk off bid, I'm looking quickly at these four and a halves because I think you are going to, may have to move fast, and especially with volatility as low as it is. Um, GDXJ, the structure is basically the same. I'm not going to waste your time basically repeating the exact same structure with just a slightly different strike selection. Let's go to TLT instead. This is a little bit cleaner. Um, sometimes you don't know if the miners are going to react the same way as, as gold in terms of magnitude, and, and that's what we haven't seen yet. But at the same time, I think that R and R is still good. Focus on TLT though. Uh, it's all about rates. We're trading 
at last week's highs. You can see the high there was 2731, 2731, 2744 with a close of 2732. So we, we closed above Wednesday and Thursday's highs. Really looks like we want to take out the, uh, the June high, which was 128.57. And we want to start filling this gap, get up here towards 130, 131. Um, so let's look at the trades there in TLT again. Volatility is not as cheap as what we've seen in uh, like the gold miners that I mentioned. It's a little bit more like gold, but I think a little cheaper than gold here. And if you compare it to like S&Ps, obviously s and is trading a lot higher, a lot juicier. So if, if we get a risk off bid, this is a better way to play it than trying to buy S&P puts, I believe. Um, that's where I go again into the September term. Um, we're looking at half to three quarters of a percent move per day. Um, over the course of three weeks, that would be between two and three percent. So that's called two and a half percent is about three bucks and puts us up to that 130 32 so a single standard deviation puts us above 130 the chart just above 130 that's another really good target on the chart so i like the one standard deviation move in over the course of three weeks from both a standard deviation you know sort of statistical reason as well as from a chart reason if you're gonna play for that move you need to be looking at the uh probably 29s here 47 cents the 30s aren't going to give you any leverage because that's going to just be a break even on that move. The 128 and a halves, if you get a move there, then these could be worth around two bucks. So you get about three to one. These are worth about a buck and a half, roughly three to one. So, you know, the 28 and a half and 29s are pretty good, both. I like the 29s a little better again because I think that the volatility could come up a lot if we start to make that kind of move. Yes, this is not a vol an incredibly va a Vega intense option. But at the end of the day, it's got a little bit of Vegas still. And if you start to get that rally this week off of non-farm payrolls, I think these could be really and, and get a little more exciting. So I'm going to be looking at those actually pretty closely this week. I like the September 1, 29s and TLT. Um, and I, I think that that's one of our better plays. You know, the gold miners in TLT, much better than, than trying to trade in GLD, SLV, or uh, again, looking at um, macro indices puts. Just I don't see it. Excuse me. Uh, next up, let's go back to EWZ. So this one has played out kind of perfectly from our conversation last week. So last week, let's go through this again. Friday had a really nice close here. Um, we were looking at potentially looking to buy for a breakout. I wanted to see a, a, cl a close here around 39.30. We got that on Tuesday. Then we had the breakout. The high at the end of the week was $40.57. The high of this move was $40.46. So we've taken out those highs. We've not yet taken out these highs, $40.80. But as long as the world isn't going to hell, uh, I think you're going to continue to see flows into Brazil. On top of that, our volatility in um, the Brazilian indices here Continue to be low. We got a little bit of an uptick on Friday. That's nice. We've got a little bit of an uptick in uh, realized volatility. That's nice. The biggest difficulty we've got is knowing where options were last week. You know, when we were looking at these uh, calls last week, these were 24 cents and these were 14 cents. So they've come up and I'm not looking at September 8th anymore. Um, as I mentioned from the other um, other products, it's just it's not the, the place I want to focus on my energy. We'll go into September 15th. You see there was some pretty good volume on Friday here. Um, the big flow was 50 cents. Looks like it was a seller of the 41s at 50 cents. He's playing to say that there will not be a breakout. Um, actually, it may have been a buyer given that volatility was up. So eh. that's actually a little more interesting to me if there was a buyer. It's, it's, it's not 100% clear because we also have these puts trading 41. So that looks... Like there was probably a buyer there. So it could have been that there was a seller of the 41s and buyer of the 39 puts. It, it's not 100% clear to me, as I said, but the thing to me is if I'm looking for that breakout of a 4080, this is actually probably where I'm looking to buy. It's right around those 41s. I don't necessarily want to play for the big move here on the 42s. And part of that is because we're in the middle of the range for overall equity indices. 
so while this might break out and get up to 41 and a half or 42, I think in that process, we're going to be testing new all-time highs. And that's where I'm not necessarily sure I want to be all that long. And so I don't want to be stuck in a spot where the ultimate high here is 41 and a half and I'm on the 42s and trying to decide whether or not to get out before those go in the money. It's a lot easier to sell an option once in the money than while it's still out of the money and grinding higher. Uh, you want to get some intrinsic value into those options to really um, to PL them into a selling a rally mode. So this is this is a little bit of a uh, it's a smaller move play for me now. I'm not as excited as I was last week, but I still think because of where volatility is, I, I still like these calls. I'm looking at these uh, 41s, 46 cents, three weeks. One and a half percent. So that's six percent over the course of three weeks. That's two and a half bucks. That would get us all the way up to forty-two eighty. I'm not looking for anything near that um, that kind of move, though. As I said, I want something smaller. Forty ones. Maybe you go a little dangerously and go into the forty-one and a half. But again, I think that this is an interesting play, but it's not as exciting going into a long weekend after having already had part of the breakout and with equity indices kind of in that the middle of the range. Okay. Um, final sector, and this one's a little bit more interesting because of the shape of the curve. It looks a little bit more like small caps, no surprise there. XLE. So we know that oil, and I'll pull up an oil chart first, has been, this is the crude oil futures, in a tight range, but it's recovered off of the lows very well. It went from $42 in June all the way up to 48 here, and it's been chopping around 48 for the last couple of weeks. And yet XLE was trading around 64 when oil hit lows and is now trading 63 and went lower. It had a small recovery and then just a breakdown here. So there's been a, a lack of interest into energy equities in spite of the comeback in oil prices. Add to that that we've had some issues as a result of the hurricane that created a bid into Arbob, that's gasoline. You can see that that has traded up a little bit firmer than X. So oil was trading pretty flat this week. Arbob doing a lot better here. Rallied away in, in testing the highs while oil was trading in this sort of range, if we look back at that. So you can look again and say crude. See, it kind of stayed in the same range. So our Bob had the greatest firmness because of the way that the hurricane was expected to impact refineries. At the end of the day, I don't know the full minutia of which oil name I would want to buy off of this, what's been priced and what hasn't been priced. And what I do know is that I like the shape of this chart. Higher highs, higher lows. Higher high, higher low. Inside day. Higher high, higher low on the breakout from that inside day. Above the 10-day moving average, maybe pushing here towards the 20-day moving average. Then we've got, obviously, the 50 right there. We had a nice long trend down. Maybe we see a nice long trend up now over the course of about two weeks, especially if people are looking for sector rotation. Where are they looking for sector rotation? Maybe some of the underperformers get a little bit of money flow, especially with oil not collapsing. So if oil's not collapsing and XLE is starting to bounce, this may attract at least some short covering and maybe even better, some long initiation. What's been resistance the whole way down? The 100-day moving average. Sorry, the, that was the 50-day moving average, and then this is the 100-day moving average, and this is the 200. So we had the 50-day moving average create a lot of resistance. Then when oil started to rally, it, we tested the 100-day, failed, came back here. I think we're going to quickly, over the next maybe week or two, retest the 50-day moving average. That gets us a move of a buck, 64. Not that exciting. But maybe you can play some options with that. Implied volatility, high not crazy, realized volatility, low not crazy, exciting. But if you get a buck in a week, that's right in line with our uh, realized vol or implied volatility levels. And you've got really cheap fall this week relative to September. So you can see that if you're going to do anything here, it's got to be September 1st, September 8th, because September 15th, vol gets bid. A move to 64, all you're looking at here is the three and a half, four call spread if you're going this week. You get it for 13 cents. You get a four to one return if you max that out. You're probably not going to max it out. Maybe you get two or three to one. You could also just buy the three and a half. That's only two to one. That's not that great. You go into the following week, 
again, it's a 16 cent call spread. It's not that great. But I think that September 1st, you can do this three and a half, four call spread and feel okay about it. If you think that we can go above that 50 day moving average or do this move quickly, if you know more about the overall impact from on the energy equities than, than I do off of the hurricane, great. Maybe you can play this a little bit more bullishly um, and go into the 64s outright or the 63 and a halves outright. But, but as I said, what I like here is buying that 63 and a half, 64 call spread, 14 cents, 13 cents, something in that range. Might get a little bit cheaper on Monday morning since we've had the weekend theta decay out. You can't chase it. You pay 15, you kind of lose some of your R&R, especially once you add in commissions and fees. So AFX LE is near here on um, Monday morning. And we continue to hold higher highs and higher lows. Then I like the 63 and a half, 64 for a grinding higher move. And if something changes where you start thinking explosive higher move, then I'm going straight over to September 8th and I'm looking to buy the 64 and a halves. The markets are a little bit wide here. This is probably closer. You're going to have to buy something closer to 14.2% vol, like what you see on the strike above and below. That'd be closer to 17 cents. That means these are offered actually pretty cheap, bid pretty low. You may be able to get a nice mid-market fill here around 15 or 16 cents, and that would be pretty good for you if you're looking for something explosive to the upside. That's uh, something I would be looking to play on. I close above the 50-day moving average because then that tells me we probably test that 100-day moving average around 66. Well, folks, that's going to do it for the summary for today. Um, again, I just don't want to do get too aggressive playing the indices this week, especially coming into a long weekend, especially focusing on long options. IWM call spread might be an interesting play. These guys and the Dow Jones are just you know range bound. Rates, Forex, Commodity, Dollar, Yen, got to watch it, got to watch it closely. We are kind of testing around that 10-day moving average. The 10-day moving average has sort of stalled. It's not. It's a, got a very flat slope here. But as long as the dollar continues to be weak against the yen, then that should also be a sign that we're looking for risk off, which would be bullish gold, bullish gold miners, bullish on um, bonds. My favorite trade for leverage is the gold miners, but it is a bit derivative of gold. And so the bonds have a little bit of a um, benefit there. I don't necessarily want to go into gold options just because the volatility there is not as cheap as miners. Or, um, or rates. Sector-wise, still looking for a little more follow-through in Brazil. Looking for a move towards uh, 41 and a half, 42. I think on that play, you can play some September calls, but you got to be um, cognizant of where these equity indices go. If they break out to new all-time highs, great. This could keep going. If these don't break out to new all-time highs, um, but do test to the upper end of the range, then maybe this trade is over. <clears throat> And you're just looking sector rotation-wise into the energies because of the bottoming action that it's gotten there. Again, generally with, with bottoming action and just a little bit of a grind higher, I'm looking for call spreads here as opposed to explosive breakout kind of situation here. I'd like to stay in the calls in case it does break out and knowing how cheap Vol is. Vol's not as cheap here in XLE. All right, guys, contact me. Um, you know the website, tradeacademy.co, email keith at tradeacademy.co, phone number 312-600-8004, and follow me on Twitter at Trade Academy Co. I post a lot of watch lists and some trade ideas throughout the week, and um, hopefully those things can continue to add value uh, in 144 characters. Have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you guys next week.